You know, it's interesting going throughout um, society and discovering the oldest of everything. So you can just go and type on Google the oldest of everything and some of these different things are going to come up. But I came across a very interesting uh, fact about college basketball. How old do you think the oldest collegiate basketball player was to ever play? Would you say that individual be in his 40s? Or how about in his 50s? How about even daring to say their 60s? Would you say that there could be somebody that, uh, that, of that age to play basketball? Well, what's interesting is a guy by the name of Ken Paul Mink, who was born in 1935, is an American who at the age of 73 is believed to be the oldest person ever to score in a college basketball game. Mink sank two free throws for Rowan State Community College in Harriman, Tennessee in their game against King College on November 3rd, 2008. 73 years of age, playing basketball for a community college. Well, it's very interesting. We find that that guy was well up in years to play basketball at a collegiate level. No doubt about it. Most of the guys you see on, on TV, on ESPN, playing for the national championship are 18 to 25 years of age. So for somebody to be in their 70s, still getting out on the court and playing, my hat's off to them. Double thumbs up. Thank you for great health to the Lord. Well, I begin to think about our text in Genesis chapter 17, how Abraham was older than 73. The Bible says in this verse, verse number 1 of 17, that Abraham was 99 years of age when God directly spoke to him and said, Abram, I told you you're going to have a son, and now is the time. <laughs> While thinking about all these things, I wrote down this statement to label my thoughts this evening. It's never too late to start. It's never too late to start. Today, as we go through Genesis chapter 17, we're going to discover uh, that we have in this text four biblical truths that it's never too late to learn. You may be thinking in your life, well, hey, it's just a little too late for me to do this or for me to do that. But I submit to you today that as long as there is life within your mortal flesh, it is never too late to open up the Word of God and to study the contents found therein. And in Genesis chapter 17, a, a passage of Scripture that you might say, well, hey, um, the covenant that God made between Abraham and himself and this thing called circumcision has has absolutely nothing to do with me today. Actually, um, you know, this passage has a lot to do with time today. With that in mind, I invite you to, to look in verses 1 through 8. We're going to discover this truth that's never too late to learn. Throughout the Scriptures, God is known for making promises to His people. In verses 9 through 14, we're going to discover this. Circumcision was the symbol of God's covenant to Abraham. In verses 15 through 22, we'll discover this. God's promises may be hard to believe, but we must accept them by faith. And then verses 23 through 27, we're going to discover this. Obedience is the outward sign of believing in God's promises. So will you come with me as we go through this uh, account in the life of Abraham? We find in this passage of Scripture that God changes Abram's name to Abraham. And if you've been listening uh, for the past several Sunday evenings, I've just been calling Abraham, Abram Abraham throughout the whole time because I ultimately knew, in which most of you did, that his name would be changed. But now in chapter 17, we find that at 99 years of age, God comes to Abraham and he tells him I'm going to make a covenant with him. Now a covenant is like a promise but in verses 1 through 8 the text we read delivers to us that throughout the scriptures God is known for making promises to his people. Already 
This is not the first promise made in Scripture. <laughs> as early as Genesis chapter 3, and in fact, earlier than that, we find God speaking of promises. But one particular one I want to share with you today is in Genesis chapter 3, we find that God promised the Messiah would come. Chapter 3, verse 15. And we go on to find out that, that that Messiah would be the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is through Abram's descendants and his seed that this individual by the name of Jesus would be born. We go on through the book of Genesis, and we find that, that God promised by putting a rainbow in the clouds never to destroy this world again with a flood. We find already God making promises early in the book of Genesis. And I submit to you today that, that throughout the entire Old and New Testaments, God is a promise-making God. In the Old Testament, we discover that God makes promises in His law. And He says that, hey, I am going to provide me a son. In fact, Genesis 22, God promises about how He is going to provide a lamb, speaking of Jesus Christ. And that lamb was slain on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. And now we can receive the great promise of salvation found in Jesus Christ. God's promises are found throughout the Scriptures. Notice what well, the Bible goes in the same verse 2 of this chapter. It says, And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now, you've got to understand, just a few seconds here. Abram, Abraham is 99 years of age. The last time I checked, that's older than any of us in here this evening. If I'm mistaken, feel free to correct me after the service. Uh, but, but to my knowledge, nobody in this auditorium or assembly this evening is 99 years of age or older. And here we find that God looks to Abraham and says, I am going to make you a promise. And so Abram does what many of us should do. Humble ourselves and fall on our faces to the God who created us. The Bible says in verse 3, Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, now I need to say this, that God no longer talks to you and to me like He talked to Abraham. Because God has given us His full revelation of the Word of God. And so now when, this, when these crazy people get on television and said, God told me this, and God told me that, they're just a bunch of uh, crazy people who don't understand the Word of God. God has given us His portion of His Word from Genesis to Revelation, and no longer... Does God speak that way to man? I believe in what's called progressive revelation. That at certain time periods in life, which our church, by the way, believes that, so please don't misunderstand. It's nothing new around here. But, our, but we believe that, that God revealed Himself to people. He didn't unload the whole truckload at one time. He took portions off and portions off. And as He has progressively revealed His uh, Word to us, now we have the entire canon of the Holy Scripture. So, I'm sorry, as much as, uh, you know, Sister Sally and, and Brother, um, you know, uh, Bobby down the street at the, at the Church of God and the other charismatic Pentecostal assemblies are going to say that God spoke to me in an audible voice. <laughs> Listen, man, I've even asked God to do it, and He's never done it to me. But hey, you can just mark it down. That's not the way God deals with His people today. So just keep that in mind, that God doesn't talk with, with us like He talked to Abraham. Now, how do we talk to God, or how does God talk to us? Well, it's by reading His Word. So the Bible says that God talked to them, saying, verse 4, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now, you've got to understand, just imagine what's going through Abraham's mind right now. I'm 99 years of age. I have a son named Ishmael. All right. I'll have many nations. It'll just oh, all happen after I'm dead. I'm sure this is what's going through his mind. Verse 5 says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. 
Verse 6 says, And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Which we know to be true. Uh, the people of Israel wanted to be like some of the other nations and said, We want a king. So God gave them King Saul. And then God gave them King David. And God gave them King um, uh, Solomon. God gave them all the rest of the kings that are mentioned throughout the Word of God. But we got to keep in mind that, that God is our king. And that those types of governments just mimic the way God rules and reigns within His universe. He is king and He is on His throne. So He goes on to say in verse 6, And I will make thee a fruitful, and will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And the greatest king came out of him, his seed, King Jesus. Verse 7, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. So this covenant is eternal, and it's never going to end. To be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. Verse 8 goes on to say, And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So here, within the promises that God is mentioning here, He tells uh, Abram, Abraham, says, Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. He pr promises that. He says, Abraham, um, you're going to have a lot of people that's going to come out of your, uh, out of your nation. You're going to have kings that's going to come out. But then also, Abraham, I'm going to give you a certain portion of land. And he says so in verse 8. Now, verses 1 through 8, you know, you, you can make an argument and say, well, this does, has nothing to do with my life today. Well, hmm, say that, uh, that may be what it says. But, but nonetheless, what we discover between verses 1 through 8 is that throughout the Scriptures, God is known for making promises to His people. And we can take that this is a promise made to Abraham specifically and then to those who follow and now we can observe that the promises that God made to Abraham here, we can, and in fact, have reaped the spiritual blessings of salvation through some of the promises even, I believe, found during Abraham's life. Now, verses 1 through 8 teaches throughout the Scriptures, God is known for making promises to His people. It is never too late to learn that truth. But may I share you something, something else with you this evening? It is never too late to learn this. In verses 9 through 14, we discover circumcision was the symbol of God's covenant to Abraham. Circumcision was the symbol of God's covenant to Abraham. Notice what verse 9 goes on to say. It says, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after me, thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Now, if you do not understand what this means, if you're a child, I highly recommend you go talk to your father or your parents. And maybe you're an adult this evening as you don't understand what this means. Well, I'll be glad to talk with you about it after the service. But I'm just going to assume from here on out that we all understand what circumcision means. And so verse 11 says, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between, or betwixt, as the King James says, me and you. Verse 12 says, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man-child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of a stranger, of any stranger which is not of thy seed. Now, now uh, before we move any further, I just need to say this, that here the Bible tells us some specific details about this situation. But there are those in the medical field who are going to try to tell us that circumcision is actually unhealthy for the young baby boy. And the reason why is because they're not following the guidelines found in the Scriptures. How often is a child kept in a hospital today when they're born? Alright, maybe at most two to three days. 
So normally, he, here, <laughs> listen, I am not against the medical field. Please do not misunderstand what I'm saying. But you got to understand that hospitals are a business and that they need those rooms to help put people in because, the listen, it, it, there's a lot of people being born and a lot of people getting sick. So the sooner they can get you in and out, the sooner they can get somebody else who, in there who is sick. So basically, as these children are being birthed, they are being birthed and they're just, hey, they get them out and let's send them on their way. So these children, many children who are not circumcised on the eighth day may receive some health problems. As Dr. Rex Russell writes in his book, What the Bible Says, who, by the way, he is a medical doctor. I have the book in my office if you like to read it. And he talks in there about circumcision, and he literally says that if we were to follow the biblical guidelines about circumcision, and if it's done on the eighth day, there are no harmful side effects due to that process. Now, with that in mind, you can just take that, do with it whatever you want. Verse 13 goes on to say, He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So basically, what the promise is, is God says, Abraham, your children, and anybody who's in your house, it's a man. So if it's a servant, or a slave, if you will, or anybody there that, that you've brought in whether they're of your kin or not if they're in your nation now they're to be circumcised. Now it bears to be noted that some biblical historians do try to trace the practice of circ I say practice the practice of circumcision back to try to discover its original roots and there are some who say that during this time period other cultures use this in their groups of people. And some used it as a way of being notified by who they were. So if you went to this section of people and they did this particular process, then they were known as this particular group of people. So this is a first class example of just a practice that's used in common day that God takes and He sets it aside to make it His holy use for His people. And we find that circumcision was a symbol of God's covenant with Abraham. It was a symbol that on this day in Genesis chapter 17 and from this day forward, the man-child on the eighth day is to be circumcised. And it's to be done and to be followed. Now there's going to be some issues you say, well, well what about our day today? Well, I'm glad you asked. Paul the Apostle addresses that issue in Galatians. In fact, we, we, we term these individuals, uh, Paul uses the term of the circumcision. And basically, all the term is implying that there's going to be a group of people who are going to try to take um, the gospel of Jesus Christ being saved by grace through faith and adding thereto. And adding grace through faith plus fulfilling parts of the law, such as circumcision. And Paul addresses that issue, and he says justification is not by circumcision, but it is by salvation in Christ, by faith and faith alone. So it's never too late to learn throughout the Scriptures God is known for making promises to His people. It is never too late to learn circumcision was the symbol of God's covenant to Abraham. And in verses 15 through 22, we discover this truth that's never too late to learn. God's promises, excuse me, God's promises may be hard to believe, but we must accept them by faith. <laughs> now we've discussed, God promised He's going to make a great nation of Abraham. He's going to have kings come out of of, of, this, of this promise. It's going to have all this different, different stuff and then the circumcision aspect that, hey, this is part of the promise that you're fulfilling with me. And then he goes in and to discuss another promise which the reaction behind Abraham was very interesting to read. 
Look at verse 15. It says, And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, so he didn't speak out loud, he says, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And Sarai, shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Now, I've shared this before, but what's interesting, you know, you can go online and you can type the oldest of everything. You can do it. And, uh, you know, the oldest person to ever uh, that is recorded in modern history to ever give birth to a child is a lady by the name, I'm probably not pronouncing this right, so I'm very sorry to this lady, but uh, Raja Devi Lohan became the oldest person to ever give birth to a child at the age of 70. <laughs> For some of you ladies who may be around that age this evening, could you imagine giving birth to a child? <laughs> may God have mercy on you if that happens. <laughs> I'll be there to pray for you. <laughs> Anyways, so we find that it is physically possible for this to occur, which, by the way, according to the Bible here... Uh, all right, listen. There's ladies who have given birth much older than that. Before the flood, people lived to be way, well older than 90 years old. But we find that Sarah was 90 years old and Abraham is just falling on his face and he's laughing at this. And in his heart he says, shall, shall me at 100 years old have a son? And is Sarah, who's 90 years old, going to give birth to a child? In verse 18, Abraham said unto God, All that Ishmael might live before thee. Now you've got to keep in mind, God's original plan for people is one man and one woman. And in the previous chapter, we find the issue of polygamy. And God's blessing is not on that. And here we find that Abraham is just reaching out to God and says, God, why would you just use Ishmael? I mean, this is my son. Just, just, this is my son. Just use him. But notice, notice how God responds. God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. Which, by the way, means laughter. <laughs> very, very funny. And the irony in the story is very interesting. And he says, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with them, and God went up from Abraham. Now, I just want to pause just for a moment and, and say that concerning Ishmael, Obviously, Ishmael grew up in what we call a Jewish home, beginning right here. And he understood the law of God and, and these different things. But some commentators have come and, and said that through his descendants, some of them began to stray away from God. Perhaps it was jealousy over this issue. We don't really know for certain. But, but, but the Arabian culture... And groups, a lot of historians believe, can be traced back to Ishmael and Ishmael's descendants. Not the belief of the Islamic belief, but the Arabian culture. And I submit to you today that at one time the Arabian culture had the Word of God. But they chose to at some point reject it and adopted religious beliefs such as um, Islam and, and just to name one for an example. And God tells us here that, hey, His covenant would be with Isaac, not with Ishmael, most likely because it wasn't done in a proper manner. God wanted everything to be done right. And He says that my covenant is with and through Isaac. 
Now, brings me to this point. God's promises may be hard to believe, but we must accept them by faith. Just imagine. You're 99 years of age. Your wife, that is for you men, and your wife is 90 years of age. And God comes and speaks to you and says, so-and-so, says your name, you're going to have a son. <laughs> wow. Listen, we would all be like Abraham and, and laugh and be like, this is, the, the only way I believe this is if I see it. Well, listen, <laughs> later on, they see the promise in flesh. <laughs> But I, as we come to the New Testament, listen, th there are some hard things to, that, that God has promised to us. Listen, there's some hard things to believe in the New Testament. I, I can't fully wrap my mind around eternity. I can't wrap my mind around the mercy and grace of God and the fact that, that God loves me even though I am yet a sinner and will continually to be a sinner till the day I die. But God says, hey... I've redeemed you by my precious blood. And you're going to enter into heaven. That's hard for me to believe because I realize I deserve hell. But hey, we have to accept them by faith. So hey, just as Abraham had a promise from God, he, he found it hard to believe. We have promises found in the New Testament that can be challenging to believe. But it's time for us to accept them by faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hey, it's never too late to learn. Throughout the Scriptures, God is known for making promises to His people. It's never too late to learn. Circumcision was God's symbol of His covenant to Abraham. It's never too late to learn. God's promises may be hard to believe, but we must accept them by faith. But now let me share with you in verses 23 through 27, we see a drastic transition from, from Abraham who, who fell upon his face, began laughing, and said in his heart, Am I gonna give am I gonna have a child at 100 years old and my wife Sarah is 90 gonna have a son? Transitions. To obedience. Just like that. Verse 23 and following speaks of Abraham's obedience. And it's never too late to learn this fourth and final point. Obedience is the outward sign of believing God's promises. Obedience is the outward sign of believing God's promises. How did Jesus say it? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And here's what Abraham did here. Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day, as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine, when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was thirteen years old, when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael, his son, and all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of a stranger, were circumcised with him. We discover here, obedience is the outward sign of believing in God's promises. So as we look at this text, yeah, none of us are 99 years of age with a 13-year-old with a son. I mean, just imagine being a senior citizen and having a teenager as a son. Just imagine that. Just imagine being 100 years of age. And your wife giving birth to a new son. Or just imagine being 99 years of age and going through the process of circumcision. Where you remember all about it. Especially the pain and everything. And I'm here to say this. That all of this demonstrates, this, this is found in the Word of God. And it demonstrates Abraham's belief in God's promise and his obedience. So, I have to say this. If Abraham can be obedient to the promises God gave to him in Genesis 17, is it too much to ask for us to be obedient? 
to the New Testament promises given by Jesus Christ. Listen, it's never too late to begin to be obedient. Amen.